the title of this video is Pentagonal Greco Relativism. Pentagonal Re Greco Relativism. I think that's a pretty good, pretty good title. And the idea is that it's a, it's a video on relativism. And I'm going to use the, the five schools of ancient thought as illustrations now. It's not at all that those are the only five, or that they're complete, really. But they give a good spread of opinions. And they're ancient, they're at hand. We've had centuries of considering what they mean, so we all have some common understandings of that. So the point is really about relativism. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on each school of thought. Another important thing is that, uh, well, it kind of modernized some of the interpretations, and I'll tell you what I mean more about that. <coughs> so the thing is, yeah, so the thing is that um, relativism is often mischaracterized as being nihilistic, uh, somehow advocating nothing, because there is no one morality, for example, so people say, oh, there's no morality. But that would only be true if the definition of morality in insists that there's only one of them. And that's what the dispute is. You know? Relativists believe there's more than one. So you could say there's no objective morality. Fine, the relativists say that all the time. There's a relative morality, though. You know, if there's many moralities, that's not none, right? If you say there is no X such that X is an object of type A. Okay. If I have even one example, that proves that false. If I have infinite examples, it's what? Infinitely proved false. Very trivially easy to prove false. It's not even hard to find an example. So what does a relativist really do? They go around saying nothing, I'll think nothing. No. They know there's more than one view. Even when there's contradictions, there might be more than one of the people. One of the contradictions has some validity. So a relativist naturally seeks more points of view. More points of view, not less. And so that's the purpose of the Greco-relativism. So I'm going to run through with a relativistic attitude, because that's what a relativist will have in uh, her bag of tricks. It will be a bunch of philosophy a bunch of understandings of different philosophies that could generate opinions. You know, I, I don't have a particularly stoic uh, attitude naturally, but I could easily create a stoic perception and consider that among others. And each of these is, I'll, I'll talk about their strengths and their weaknesses. Now, the test subject matter is a, a resource shortage. Imagine a resource shortage. So the stoic approach to that is that you're just going to have to grin and bear it. You're going to have to endure it. An optimistic stoic might, you know, say things will get better. The drawback of stoicism is that since they think that this kind of thing builds character, which I agree it does, you can fall into a habit, a kind of pessimism where you've actually embraced the negativity. You think it's good. If you get in a position of power, for example, uh, Suddenly, it's not just a matter of, oh, life has adversity and you have to be strong, but you can create the adversity as if you're doing someone else a favor by helping them to get character, by giving them hardship. Okay, the cynical perspective on this issue is that things are fucked up anyway, that they're always going to be like this. There's always going to be resource shortages. And the strength of cynicism in other situations is that sometimes you do have to just look at things and go, fine, you know. Shit happens. Uh, you know, people are like that sometimes, or whatever. The cynical approach. You know, shit happens is kind of an optimistic cynical approach. The drawback of cynicism being, of course, that you can also uh, get into a, a deep kind of pessimism. I think it's a less insidious, philosophically speaking, a less insidious pessimism than the stoic pessimism, because it doesn't embrace the, the negativity as somehow good, because it's building character. But it can be just as devastating of a pessimism. You know, can, why, why do anything if everything is fucked up? Epicureanism is an interesting philosophy, especially on this subject matter, 
because you know it would say well we should look at our appetites and, and how we're seeking pleasure and what our appetites and consumption are and we should seek to minimize those to minimize the, the damage of the resource crisis or the resource shortage and of course that would work rather well wouldn't it and the positive strengths of Epicureanism is that it could be a very laid-back philosophy you're simply trying to, to get everybody to have you know, a reasonably pleasant time. The drawback of Epicureanism, besides the fact that now this is one of those, one of these, all of these schools of philosophy, pretty much mostly, uh, are words in the English language. Now, this is one, an Epicurean. That doesn't mean what it meant philosophically, but it does show sort of what can happen on the negative side of Epicureanism. Where if you focus on the small pleasures, and that's things like you know food, meals, and things this, that you, you, your comfort, you start to focus on your petty comforts, and so you can have Epicureanism now means people trying to get extreme pleasures. You know, not just a simple pleasure like a cup of tea and some biscuits, but the finest tea and the best biscuits with the most expensive caviar. But the real negative side of Epicureanism, because that is arguably not, not a, actually a fault of Epicureanism. Epicurus would have said that was trying to maximize the small pleasures and make them into these maximal things by having high value. So that's, that's debatable. But I think the real negative potential of Epicureanism is that it advocates a zero-sum game. It doesn't really have a way to explain how we could have progress or, or you know, plan a trip that's going to be just all good. Um, or not even just all good, but net some good. So there's a sort of a cynicism in there in the sense that you can never get ahead. But it's not so cynical because it doesn't actually say, oh, well, things are screwed up anyway, we're, we're behind forever. Pythagoreanism, these are the idealists of this group of five. Um, and they love numbers and geometry and patterns. Those are the language of patterns. So. Uh, if you know what I mean, I mean, you need a pattern to count things, to have numbers so that you can count things in your pattern. Every apple is unique. You only can count, really, that pattern. You see an apple, and it's unique, but you see, oh, it has this pattern. And then you see another apple, which is also unique and different, but it has the same, same pattern. Hello, so I was interrupted. But anyway, um, so the strength of Pythagoreanism is, yeah, this is, does come down to numbers and the patterns. We have to analyze what's going on in our resource usage, where they are located geographically, how far that is, all the geometry of the relationship between where there's production and where there's going to be consumption. Obviously, that's going to work. Now, the drawback of Pythagoreanism is it can become over-ideal. People that fall in love with the patterns have made the same mistake over and over of thinking eventually that the patterns are separate from the thing that they're in, that the pattern of carbon atoms is separate from the, the thing that, that you're looking at. But the pattern of carbon atoms is a part of what makes something a diamond. And, you know, if you take that part out and say, look, it has that part of this arrangement, that's just like saying, oh, look, it has this part of carbon. It doesn't mean, you know, the carbon's still considered a part of that physical diamond. Why would the arrangement not be considered? It should be. Spatial organization, the geometry, is a material thing. It's part of a, uh, of a material object, and it's part of what it, what it means for it to be a diamond as opposed to a chunk of coal, and that's an important difference. We don't ignore that difference and pretend that it's, it's uh, separate from the thing. The fact that, that it's arranged a particular way is separate from the thing. And so you can get these idealizations where you forget that every time you talk about patterns, you're talking about patterns in the real world, and you start to think you're talking about something besides the real world. Okay, And that then can make you not care about things like the fact that this resource shortage is not about numbers and patterns ultimately, but it's about people starving or dying of thirst or whatever the resource shortage is, is, uh, consists of.